guys. Thanks for tuning into this episode. Today I have a really awesome guest. Her name is Shan Kamins. Um, she's a young entrepreneur and she's actually the founder of Booch Organic Kombucha. Um, it's a company that started in London, Ontario, and it's relatively young, but it's already being distributed all across Ontario in grocery stores and restaurants all over the place. Um, so she's actually a really big expert on gut health and fermentation and all the different ways that we should be taking advantage of that in our diets. And she's trying to incorporate that into beverages and drinks that we can all consume um, in a healthy way. So thanks for checking it out. And I hope you enjoy this podcast. Yeah, thanks for joining me today, Shannon. Thanks for having me. (laughs) Um, yeah, I'm glad we could set this up because I know you're doing some really cool stuff with your company and, um, there's a huge kind of health foods trend in general, Mm -hmm. especially with gut health and everything. I'm sure you know way more about that than me. Mm -hmm. Um, so hopefully you can teach me a little bit. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, the first question I just wanted to ask is like, what is the deal with kombucha? Like, why is it so good for you? (laughs) Interesting. Um, I'll keep it really broad. Okay. Um, Kombucha has been around for like 2,000 years. So it originated in China, and then it moved to Russia and across the whole world. Um, And fermented foods have been a part of people's diets in cultures all around the world for just as long. Um, So now that kombucha is gaining popularity, it's interesting because it's not new. Um, So it's this old thing. But in, I think it was in the 90s, Um, The first kombucha company started and it really took off. So now what we're seeing is the kombucha industry is skyrocketed. Um, And the popularity is just out of this world. So, um, yeah, it's really interesting how much it's taken off. But, uh, like, research just suggests that it's just going to continue to keep going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure it's just going to keep exploding. Like, Mm -hmm. all the health food, um, everything to do with kind of new school health practices, um, it's all exploding. I mm-hmm. think nutrition in general, just because the information is all out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know my parents' generation, I don't see many of them who are really interested in it, but I don't think they knew that much about nutrition and health back then. Yeah. Um, but our generation is huge into it. I don't know, how, how old are you actually? <laughs> so I'm 29. Oh, okay, you're 29. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah, so for sure. Um, yeah. How did you come up with the idea to start a kombucha company? Hmm. So I guess um, it would probably I probably would have started experimenting with kombucha in my twenties and fermenting foods. But my background is in health sciences, um, and then I took health promotion and then food security. So I started to question what I was eating, what I was putting in my body, um, and then it was in two thousand six when I was diagnosed with celiac. Um, so that's an autoimmune to gluten. Um, so I really cared about what I was putting in my body and I started researching fermentation and the effects that it has on gut health. Um, so at that point I started making kombucha and fermenting other things like sauerkraut and kimchi. Um, I even started fermenting oats, which is pretty fun. Yeah. Um, because it, it pre-digests the food that you're eating. Um, so at that time I, I started connecting with local farmers in the area because I was working at a local organic food delivery service. Um, and at the time my contract was ending and simultaneously all of my friends had started their own companies. Um, so there's a few really key people in London that motivated and inspired me to take that jump and open a kombucha company. Uh, so I guess it was three and a half years ago that I decided to start Booch and take it on, um, just part-time to see how it would take off and kind of pilot it in London. Um, and then after the first farmer's market, I sold out. I think I only brought six cases worth of kombucha. And so I started making more and every market day I would sell out again and again. And that was the point where I realized that, um... There was so much opportunity in London, um, and the people wanted it, and it was supported by everyone. So I did it full-time and started hiring people and growing the business from there. Cool. Mm -hmm. So at this point, were you just working out of, like, your garage or something like that? (laughs) No, but I did start fermenting in my apartment and selling it to friends and family. 
Um, but then I rented a little 10 by 10, um, a 10 by 10, like a, a space at my previous employers. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it was, it was inspected by the health unit. So it was safe. Cool. Cool. Yeah. And that was just on a part-time basis, but you still had yeah. a space rented. Yeah. So mm-hmm. how far into it did you end up getting that grant through Western to be able oh, to kind of so, take it to the next level? Mm-hmm. So Booch got the grant about two years ago and it was through Western's, um, Propel PSI program. And that really helped Booch grow the business because we were able to connect with, um, well, different marketers, um, the food and beverage industry. So we, we had a lot of mentors kind of help grow the business at that point. Um, but it was still already taking off before we even got that grant. That's awesome. Yeah. Cause I guess in 2016, kombucha was the number one, a Google searched word for health trends. No way. Yeah. So at that point in time, like the kombucha industry is like, it's, it had fully taken off. Um, and I think there's statistics now, like 10 years ago, the kombucha industry was, um, worth just over like a hundred million dollars. And now, um, currently it's like a one, one billion dollar industry. And then by 2020, they're uh, expecting it to grow to a $2 billion industry. So in just a short amount of time, like the popularity of kombucha and fermented foods as a whole has just taken off completely. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, yeah. from what I have noticed, I would say that when apple cider vinegar kind of took mm-hmm. off, mm-hmm. that's right when kombucha was taking off as well. Yeah. Except I actually never got really into kombucha. I know a mm-hmm. lot of people did. My mom drinks it almost every day. Does she? But, mm-hmm. um, but I, yeah, I take apple cider vinegar almost every morning. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just for yeah. the whole gut health thing and, and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And we actually, if you ferment your kombucha long enough, it does create a vinegar. And that's a shelf stable product that we also sell at oh, the really? retail store. Mm-hmm. Okay, and, and it's it, the same. It's one of those. It's a type of vinegar where you would just take a shot every day. Yep. Oh, okay. Like we recommend diluting it with water because it is acidic, so it can be hard on your digestive tract or your um, tooth enamel. But it's okay. the same thing. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I usually just drink water right after I take yeah. a shot anyway, or I dilute it. Yeah, yeah. I guess I do that sometimes as well. Hmm. Um. So when it comes to gut health, I think a lot of people don't really know about this yet. Mm-hmm. What is going on with gut health and why do right. are things like kombucha and apple cider vinegar actually really good for you? Right. So um, I think if you talk to people almost every day, they'll say that there's some type of digestive disturbance. So there's like bloating or gas or like some type of discomfort that a lot of people have. Um, and women especially are like the first to raise their hands and say like, yes, I have cramping or bloating. Um, so what we're finding is all of these people have some type of gut issue. Um, and there hasn't been a lot of, um, like research on what's going on at that level. But what we believe is by consuming a diet full of fermented foods, you're actually incorporating all of those microbes into your uh, small and large intestine. So you're kind of building your immune system by drinking kombucha or eating any other raw fermented product. Mm -hmm. Um, The fermentation process alone, it creates B vitamins. um, So when you're drinking or consuming that product, you're actually getting all these other vitamins and minerals that you wouldn't get in the raw form of the food. And it's just populating your gut with all that good bacteria. So it's boosting your immune system, but it's also helping digest your food because it's technically pre-digested. So by consuming kombucha um, when you're eating a meal, you're actually going to be able to digest everything you're eating much better. And it makes it more bioavailable for your body to absorb. Okay, really cool. Yeah. And from what I've read recently, it's becoming very common knowledge that your microbiome Mm-hmm. is also has a really large tie with your mentality and your mindset yes. and your mental health. Yes. Um, there has been research that, that suggests that it's absolutely connected. Um, so the state of your gut will have everything to do with the state of your mind. And the research suggests that the, the microbes in your gut will actually influence behavior and gene expression. So you'll find that in the digestive tract of people who are say, anxious or depressed or potentially obese, they have a very different microflora than um, someone that's more calm or has a less less stressful life. Um, so the bacteria really do influence your behavior directly. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's super cool. It's so cool. Um, I personally, so I've been into health for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess I've always been very active and that kind of, that's what was a spinoff into the nutrition interest and all of that uh, research that I've done for years now. Mm-hmm. But personally, I actually was recovering from a surgery a few years ago and it got me a lot more interested in everything. I started doing a lot of research and it threw me down that kind of whole path of Mm -hmm. figuring out my own approach to nutrition. Mm -hmm. And I think the one reason I'm really interested in gut health and microbiome stuff is because um, I know for most people who are trying to approach their health from a new way Mm -hmm. um, or from a new perspective, it's all about vitamins. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a new perspective about that, which kind of is more about what can you eat to affect mm-hmm. your mindset and your mind state and the way that you're thinking mm-hmm. and keep you more healthy in that way? And that's something that I've got way more interested in. And that's everything I take is more related to that now. I take magnesium, omega-3, mm-hmm. and then I do apple cider vinegar and a few other things. Mm-hmm. But I think there's a lot more benefits to that because it's kind of an approach mm-hmm. to nutrition that directly affects your external world as well. Because mm-hmm. if you're already a pretty healthy person, you eat well, mm-hmm. you're getting a lot of vitamins. You are a pretty healthy person. Mm-hmm. And um, I know, I guess you as a celiac, mm-hmm. uh, you know this, but I think everyone's bodies are totally different. And it's not necessarily that everyone needs different vitamins and everything. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I was talking to a guy at a nutrition store just this week, and he was mm-hmm. saying exactly that. He was like, "If really in this day and age, if you mm-hmm. want to be really in, really uh, in tune with your health, you need to just do blood work and figure out what works for you because everyone is totally different. Absolutely. And gut health is huge. And he mm-hmm. went on a huge rant about gut health. And mm-hmm. Well, and everyone's digestive tracts have different levels of different bacteria, but Really, um, we're more bacteria than we are human DNA cells. So bacteria outnumber our cells by nine to one, um, the cells that make up our genetic code. So technically, we're more bacteria. So it's like if we're eating that, that's the best thing for us. Wow, that's crazy. I know. That's crazy. I never knew that. <laughs> mm-hmm. Did you, so did you study, like, did you study health science before you went into all of this? Yep. Where did you study that? Yeah, so I took health sciences at Western. Okay, yeah. cool. And then I took a food security certificate through Ryerson, and that's where I was learning about, um, like, strengthening local food systems and supporting local farmers and kind of the politics behind food. And that's why with Booch, I really, um, I make sure that at any time that's possible, I can support local organic farmers and strengthen our local food systems. Um, obviously tea and sugar come from the other side of the world. So we're sourcing our tea from Sri Lanka and our sugar is coming from Brazil. Yeah. It's super cool, but we've introduced a seasonal flavor lineup. So every three months, um, the seasonal flavor changes depending on what's growing locally in season. So then it allows us to partner with local, local organic farmers, um, and strengthen their livelihoods. Okay, cool. Yeah. And then um, it educates all the consumers on what's even growing in season. Like, it, it opens that dialect so that people can be more, like, proactive in their choices in supporting local. Mm-hmm. And they can be more yeah. aware of what kind of foods they can get at different times. Yeah. I mean, it makes perfect sense. hmm So, you just gave me a booch, a blueberry one, and it's, <laughs> it's obviously delicious, but it tastes different than most of the kombuchas I've had. Yeah. So... I asked you before we started recording, and you were like, are you sure you want to ask this before you turn it on? So I just want to hear what you have to say about that. Right. Um, so what makes Booch different yes. than other brands? Well, yes. I think in general, there's there's a lot of things. Um, in general, it, the business is based not just on the sale of a product, but it's it surrounds this idea of connection. Um, so it's connecting with one's gut. Um, connecting with the community and that's the farmer piece where we really try to share the story of the farmers and then connecting with the planet. Um, So we do a lot of environmentally sustainable business practices um, including composting and we're bullfrog powered. Have you heard of bullfrog powered? I have heard of it before but I have no idea what it is. Mm -hmm. So essentially it's subsidizing like green energy so solar and wind and putting it back on the grid so we match whatever we use um, in terms of energy at our facility to hopefully subsidize 
solar and wind for oh, the future. Mm-hmm. Wow. So how yeah. do you do that? <laughs> well, Is... we just write them a check. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. That makes sense. I was yeah. just going to say, you guys have that going too? Because that seems like a whole yeah. business on its own. I guess yeah. that's what bullfrog power is. Yeah. Okay. So they know how to make it all work. Okay. Um, that makes perfect sense. That's why I see bullfrog power underneath kind of all these sustainable companies, exactly. like websites and stuff on their Yeah, exactly. On their footer. Okay, mm-hmm. cool. Um, but the one you're drinking right now, the blueberries are from um, Blueberry Hill Farm. That's just in Rodney, Ontario. And then I'm trying to think what else I added. I added um, honey in there, which is from a uh, local permaculture farm in Aylmer. Um, and lavender. So, you know, it's, it's okay. connecting with those farmers, um, building their livelihoods and, and showing them that when they're growing permacultural or organic, that that's, that's what we want to vote and purchase. Awesome. Yeah. So who's coming up with these flavors? Are you inventing them? <laughs> I'm inventing them. Nice. Yes. You're the one in the lab. Yeah. That's I cool. come up with all the flavors. Um, so that one is a weekly flavor. So we only sell our weekly flavors at our retail store. Uh, and they change every single week. So I have a network of foragers that will go out and get reishi mushroom or sumac or spruce tips or pine tips. Wow. Um, and yeah, the network is just huge and amazing because we get to do the funnest uh, experiments. We're doing sea buckthorn right now. And again, it's it's increasing the knowledge of all of our consumers because a lot of the times people don't even know that you can walk around in a forest and pick these random sumacs and actually make something that's amazing for you and high in vitamin C. And, you know, it's adding all these different vitamins and minerals that you wouldn't normally get into your diet. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. It's That's another thing that's really interesting is the rise of understanding about mushrooms and how healthy they are mm-hmm. and how you can, in any part of Canada, basically, you can walk into a forest and find something edible that's filled with more vitamins than yes. a lot of even veggies and stuff. Yeah. Which is so, so neat. So true. We, um, we have one of our original six flavors is called Chaga Chai. Um, so we partner... That's the one I've tried, actually. Oh, is it? That's the one I've tried, wow. yeah. That's awesome. And that's because my old roommate got super into Chaga. <laughs> I just, I remember <laughs> it all now, yeah. Yeah, and Chaga is amazingly high in antioxidants, um, and it grows on birch trees in, in the north, so we get ours from Quebec. Um, we partnered with a forager who only ethically harvests them, uh, which is something that we have to consider because when we're consuming superfoods, you know, sometimes they're not ethically harvested. And then what does that mean when it comes to, f- does that mean you're stealing it from someone else's land? No, ethically harvested. Yeah. Cause it's so all it, coming from wild it, trees. You it's know? coming from a wild tree, but it, it's ensuring that the chaga mushroom has grown, like has, has been on the tree growing for like it's 20 years. Oh, so okay. they're not prematurely picking them or over picking them. Same thing with like leeks. When you go into a forest, you're not supposed to pick the entire um, ground full of leeks. You're supposed to leave like 10% so that next year more will grow back. I've heard about that. Yeah. I actually have a friend who's a big forest, I mean a forager and he oh, lives yeah. in BC and he will just post these Instagram stories when he's foraging mm-hmm. and he'll leave a few there and he's like, just yeah. leaving these guys for next time <laughs> or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's always fun kind of seeing what he's up to. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. So, um, as far as your business goes, mm-hmm. how did that, like where, where do you guys kind of stand right now in terms of how big your business is and where it's heading? I just, honestly, I don't even have any clue. So I'm mm-hmm. just really curious to hear right. about that side of it. Um, so when we started, it was a small 10 by 10 space, like I mentioned, and then we ended up taking over the facility, um, the whole facility that the 10 by 10 was in. So it was about a 1200 square foot space, which is now used for our retail store. Uh, and then we moved to a new facility. Um, that's about 9,000 square feet just a year and a half ago. Okay. Um, so it's, it's very large, uh, but we're filling it up quickly. We have huge walk-in coolers and huge brewing vats that are about a thousand liters each. Um, so it's massive. Yeah. That's crazy. So, I mean, I'll let you keep going. Oh, um, I feel like the story is a And I guess longer. over the period of that time of the three and a half years, we're now selling to, I guess it'd be around 400 retailers across Ontario. Um, so we're in the, the big stores like Sobeys and Farm Boy, but um, we really love our partnerships with the smaller retailers like Pretty Natural and Quartermaster and On The Move Organics and 
um, all of our, our local friends were at different restaurants and cafes and health food stores. Um, and now uh, kombucha on tap is becoming this big thing. So we have fill up stations all over the city and just outside the city. So people can refill their bottles uh, at a discounted price. Okay. These little bottles or are they bigger ones? They're both. So at our retail store, you can bring back the small bottles or you can fill a liter bottle. Um, and then around the retail, around the um, Vooch on Tap retailers, they have one liter bottles. That's an fill. awesome move. That's yeah. kind of like taking on the growler trend and, exactly. and bringing it over to kombucha. Yeah. That's cool. So you guys are strictly in Ontario right now? Yes. And do you have plans on moving to other places soon at all or anything like that? Mm -hmm. I can see us going Canada-wide soon enough um, within the year. But for me, what's really exciting is the possibility of introducing new product lines in our already successful retail stores. Okay. So, yeah. We'll see where, where the growth takes us, but it would be awesome to see our product across Canada, okay. especially in Manitoba, which is where I'm from. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so did you move here for school and then just stay? Yeah, my dad got a job promotion, so I, I moved here a year before university. Oh, really? And then I came to London for school. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. When you're talking about new product lines in your existing mm. retailers, is that kind of... I know before we started recording, you were talking about infusing more natural health foods into mm -hmm. the kombucha and trying to experiment with that. Is mm -hmm. that something you're kind of working on right now? And Yes. Um, so Booch actually has applied for two grants with Fanshawe College. Uh, so we have found a researcher that's um, on board with experimenting with different plant medicines. So we're, we're seeing where that could go, and um, hopefully the potential is there to actually put that in our kombucha and sell it across Ontario. Um, so that's one of them. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Mm -hmm. How many employees do you have right now? So we have 17 right now. Are they people, like how many, how, how does that growth kind of happen over the, the last few years? Did it just really explode when you had to go to this new warehouse just this year? Um, or was it kind think, of all along you yeah, had, had people? Yeah, it's been this organic, fast-paced growth since the start. So um, what I found with Booch is that the right people always end up finding us. Um, so even before I will post a job ad, we'll get resumes and cover letters from people that really care about the values of the brand versus just the product that we're making. Um, so we already know that the candidates coming in are just um, so deeply invested in, in our values and what we're doing that, that they would probably make the best employees. And that's what I found is that they're um, deeply on board with what we're doing at Booch and they will do anything um, so we've kind of created this family tribe environment um, where everyone has important opinions and they're, her they're heard and they're valued and they're all a part of the whole process. And then they feel really excited when they're out selling the kombucha or talking to people that are drinking it, being like, I, I bottled that kombucha. Yeah. So, yeah, the team is just incredible in that, every way. That's really cool because mm -hmm. you guys really do have a nice brand. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's a good image and it kind of presents that whole culture of, of health minded, health mindfulness and mm -hmm. being aware of helping out lo local farmers and mm -hmm. everyone in those situations. Um, yeah. So how much time were you putting into it when you first started the company, when it was just a part-time operation? So to be fair, it was only a part-time operation for like two weeks. Oh, really? <laughs> because the demand was so intense that I knew I had to like spend a hundred percent of my time working on building the business. Um, but one of the main reasons that I decided to take the jump to even start Booch was because of my best friend who owns another local business in London. Um, her name's Roxana Purdy and she owns pretty natural, but, um, oh, cool. yeah, she's amazing and incredible. And she's revolutionary in London in that she inspires, um, women especially to go for their dreams and passions and start their own businesses. So she's created this hub of all local entrepreneurs. Um, and then as soon as you decide to take that step, there's so much support in the community that helps you build and, and grow your business to make it thrive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you have a vision of turning this into a business at the at the very start or did it just kind of happen as soon as you tried it out and you just realized that you had to jump fully in and and just go for it 
I think originally I thought this would be a part-time endeavor for a year or two. Um, and then because of its success from the start, I realized that I have to do it a hundred percent, um, and put everything that I have into building and growing the business. Um, because part of it is making, making it accessible for people. So boot at Booch, we want to be in more guts, right? So we want to have that connection with all of the people that are drinking it. So in order to do that, we have to grow and sell it across the province okay. and maybe Canada. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Eventually, I'm sure you will. Yeah. Did you go through a point in time where you're working just every hour of the day? Just Did you have to go through that kind of entrepreneurial yes, stage? Okay. I absolutely did. There was so many tears and a lot of sweat. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, there would be nights that I was up incredibly late just washing pails that was my job for the first pretty much year of the business is was growing it um and we made everything in small batches at the time so pretty much I was a dish dishwasher for the first year of the business um just to try to get it off off the ground um like dishwashing your own dishes yeah yeah the yeah, pails yeah endless yeah. pails and utensils and strainers and pots and oh man just mm -hmm. constant labor constant labor that's yeah. really cool um yeah. when i was still in london i was working at uh that shared workspace innovation works yes. i was telling you about that but um i know a lot of people over the years who have tried to start businesses and they didn't really work out mm -hmm. um and i had this kind of thought that wow it's insanely hard to start a business mm -hmm. but i went there and there's so many people who are doing well and they run their own businesses and mm -hmm. they're all doing really interesting stuff. I know you have some connections to a lot of the people in there, mm -hmm. but, um, but I was really kind of surprised by the polarity and all the people in, in that building who are running their own businesses, they work really hard mm -hmm. and they focus on networking and they focus on all these different things. And, um, I kind of saw a really big difference between all my friends who weren't really making it and all my friends who were. And it really mm -hmm. woke me up to how, like, how hard entrepreneurs actually work to, to, to totally. get to where they are. Mm -hmm. um, Do and, you find that the difference that you saw, was that because there was a passion in some people and then just this need or want to perhaps be successful and have a business? Um, yeah, for sure. But... Yeah, I think a lot of the people I know who didn't do well, they mm -hmm. just kind of, they just wanted the perks of being their own boss, but right. it wasn't really about what they were doing. Right. And all the people at Innovation Works are mm -hmm. really, they love what they do mm -hmm. and they're really passionate about their work. Wow. And I mean, it was, it was such a good influence on me just being in there and being surrounded by those people. But mm -hmm. it's such a real trend that I've noticed in the last couple of years because mm -hmm. In the last year, I've put a lot of emphasis on my own career, and I've met a lot of people, and I've bounced mm -hmm. around a decent amount already, mm -hmm. but all the people who are doing super well are actually the people who are super happy, and they're super mm -hmm. happy because they like what they do, mm -hmm. so it all just kind of is full circle. It's like their whole life is part of... They're just always focusing on things that bring so much value to them personally. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's so true. It's their passion, so it doesn't even feel like work. Like when I'm at events... I am so grateful to be pouring people kombucha and talking about the product and all of the love that goes into it and the ingredients. It just doesn't feel like work. Yeah. I feel like people can tell when you're genuine about what you're selling because you're not even asking for a sale. It just happens. For mm -hmm. sure. For sure. Yeah. yeah. I know there's one friend of mine who I'm going to do a podcast with her, but she, mm -hmm. she's basically, she runs an international yoga school cool. and we were just kind of chatting and I was like, what kind of questions should I ask you? Like, is there anything you want to talk about? Mm -hmm. Cause I like to kind of pick a topic and have some kind of theme to it at least. Mm -hmm. But uh, her response was that she, she was like, I don't want to talk about how I got here. Like, that's so boring. That's what everyone <laughs> asks. This, I'll just tell you one answer for that. And it'll be like two sentences long. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be this, that I just knew that it was going to happen right from the start because I wanted it. And I just, mm -hmm was so sure that it happened that every time something didn't work, I just took the next step and did something mm -hmm. different. And there's always a different approach to get to the same place. You just have to kind of be ready to, to try something new instead of just being discouraged by everything. I mean, mm -hmm. obviously she's really, has a really kind of confident entrepreneurial mindset, mm -hmm. but I think you kind of need that as an entrepreneur anyways. For just sure. In general. Yeah. Like, yeah, I think setting the intention, right? It's like I knew I wanted to do something that 
had a health oriented basis to it. And I wanted uh, people to be the best versions of themselves. So even through fermenting kombucha and making booch, I knew that was kind of my avenue for that. Um, but putting the intention out there to the universe, uh, that's been a huge part of it because <laughs> it all happened and then everything else comes together when you least expect it. Yeah. Um, and it's not like I have a business background. So, you know, my background is health sciences and along the way you learn how to grow a business through all of the mentors around around London and area that are willing to help. For sure. Yeah. That's one thing that I've been really interested in lately too is mentors. Mm -hmm. um, my boss at work has a mentor. Um, Tyler, who we were just talking about, has a bunch of mentors. A lot mm -hmm. of different people have these mentors. And I've always thought that, honestly, I was such a different person like five years ago. But I remember mm -hmm. when I was in business school, people were telling me, you should try and find a mentor who's doing something that you like. And I guess, to be honest, I had no idea what I wanted to do in any capacity back then. So there was no real motivation for me to do that. But I've been really awakened to the whole mentor thing. Did you have any mentors? Mm -hmm. Oh, I guess you did. You just... I mean, some of the small small business owners, um, they were all mentors. Even from like my lawyer to my accountant to my banker, they all have given me a ton of great advice. Um, the researchers that I work with at Fanshawe and Western, they're all mentors as well. Um, I'm trying to think of anyone else that's made a huge impact for Booch. That's about it. Okay. All those people. <laughs> cool. This is kind of becoming a common theme in all of my, um, all of my episodes, mm -hmm. I guess. But, um, the first episode was with a, a female entrepreneurship coach. Okay. And she was huge into the law of attraction. That was what the whole episode was about. Right. And just, it's almost like a weird synchronicity or whatever. But ever mm -hmm. since that episode, I've been meeting all these random people who are super into law of attraction. Mm -hmm. And t I just, you talking about intention and kind of letting, me, letting things come back to you mm -hmm. makes me think that you're probably into it too. Absolutely. And I don't even know a ton about the law of attraction. Do you want to talk about it? <laughs> Um, do I want to tell yeah. you about it? Oh man, this is like becoming, <laughs> do you ever listen to Joe Rogan's podcast? Sometimes. Okay. Yeah. I, I feel like law of attraction for me and mm -hmm. my podcast is becoming like Joe Rogan talking about coyotes. Like he just talks about coyotes every episode for like <laughs> a, at least a few sentences. They're pretty cool. They're pretty, I know so much about them just because of him, but yeah, they're pretty wild. Um, so in simple terms, the law of attraction is basically... Mm -hmm you know what you want and you're very aware of it and you right. focus on what you want instead of what you don't have. Right. Instead of focusing like on like the lack of what you, you mm -hmm. want. Um, and it just helps you get, it helps the world kind of create opportunities for you that help you get those situations. Right. But there's so many different angles to it that mm -hmm. are really mind blowing. Like quantum physics, there's a certain there's a certain part of quantum physics mm -hmm. in this world that doesn't really make sense. Like atoms... When you go down to atoms, they can be a frequency or they can be a physical object. Right. And everything is made of atoms and atoms mm -hmm. are like 95% nothing. Mm -hmm. they're, I mean, they're like 99.9% .9 nothing. Right. So like this wall is completely solid, but right. it's made of nothing basically. Right. Like 0.1% of that is anything. But this air is also made of atoms. Like right. it's a crazy thing to think about it that mm -hmm. way. Um, so that stuff is really when it gets super deep. Mm -hmm. But in the end, it's just kind of being aware of what you want right. can help you get it. For sure. And it seems to be a really common trend because most of the people I'm going to interview on here are people who are entrepreneurs or they're doing really neat stuff because those are the stories that I want to hear about. Mm -hmm. And those are the stories that I guess anyone listening wants to hear about too. Absolutely. And you don't, people who are doing cool things didn't just like float into it by complete chance. They no. really did it. No. Like, that doesn't really happen. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I it's remember a common I theme. planted the seed for Booch like seven years before it started, and I wrote down everything I ever wanted to do in a business that I was to own one day. So looking back, from seven years from, <laughs> looking back to seven years ago, finding that that paragraph of what I wanted, it it showed me just how much how powerful an intention can be. Mm -hmm. Crazy. Um, but interesting that you brought up atoms um, because at Booch, while we believe that everything is energy and has a vibration, right? 
So we follow Dr. Masaru Emoto's research. Um, he's a Japanese researcher. Have you heard of him? I've never heard of him. Oh, okay. So he researches um, water molecules under a microscope. Oh, okay. I have heard about this. Right. I have heard about this. Yeah. So he's recently. done experiments um, with water where he, um, for, for one jar of water, he will give negative energy to and say, I hate you and you're evil and you're ugly. And then he'll photograph them under a microscope. And what he found was that the, the water molecules were um, asymmetric and distorted. And then he did the same thing to a jar of water that um, he said, I love you too, and you're beautiful, and um, I'm grateful for you. And what he found was those water molecules turned into beautiful, symmetrical snowflake shapes. Yeah, and you can see those photos. Like, you can look them yeah. up and see them. Yeah, so it's the same thing um, Albert Einstein is saying, that everything is energy and has a vibration. So it confirms that. Um, same with music. So what we do at Booch is we brew intentionally. So you'll find if you read the ingredient lists, um, positive energy and love is listed on every single bottle because we're actually putting that in there. So when people drink booch, oh. a lot of the times they say, like, wow, it tastes so good. Or they can feel the love that goes into it. It's because we really do put the love in it. <laughs> that um, is so and cool. the molecules are probably um, changed and, and symmetric and beautiful in every way. So that, that's something that we're really proud of. That is so cool. Yeah. So that basically is law of attraction. Right. So I figured. Yeah, that, that, that was a, that's in a bunch of the videos and the things mm -hmm. that I've, I was reading about. So cool. Um, yeah, that's super interesting. Mm -hmm. um, what, what else was I going to say? Yeah, a few months ago, I was actually talking to Andy. And <laughs> he recently has put a lot more focus on his business. And he's been doing really well. And he's, like, really happy about it for sure. Mm -hmm. And he said something that just, it just seems so perfectly logical that for some reason we never, ever think about. But he was, like, talking about all that research on plants which is the same thing that you're talking mm -hmm. about the water, where you, if you put really nice words on like mm -hmm. your plant, the vase, or mm -hmm. or on like you talk to it or you touch your plants every day, like there's been a lot of studies that that mm -hmm. makes them grow better. Mm -hmm. And this stuff is not like necessarily pseudoscience anymore because mm -hmm. it's pe tons of people have done this these studies, mm -hmm. but they're so out there that I feel like they never get enough credibility. Right. But he was saying if this works with plants. Think about it. Why do people not take it seriously with people? Mm -hmm. Like, how come when we don't talk to each other, we're not trying to pump each other up all the time and we're not just like talking really positively to everyone because it mm -hmm. works with plants. It obviously works with people. And it's, it's like the whole mindset training thing. Like I know mm -hmm. I personally, um, I don't talk about it that often. I feel like I talk about it a lot more now that this podcast is coming out, but I've spent a lot of time trying to train my mindset and mm -hmm. I do a lot of different things to try and move that forward. And that's become a huge emphasis for me. But I think that's exactly what Andy's talking about. It's like you just make sure you find new strategies to talk to yourself in good, positive ways. Because it's so easy mm -hmm. to get stuck in bad habits. It's like negative yeah. thinking is an addiction. It really Absolutely. is. Absolutely. Like, I and think it's it, a habit. Yeah. Yeah. And once you and crack same with it. with positive thinking. It's yeah, a habit also. For, sh for sure. Mm -hmm. For sure. And that's like something that's probably been like, I've read a lot of books about really practical stuff. Like I work in advertising and I read a lot of books about advertising. I read a lot of books about creativity and all those different processes and practical skills. Mm -hmm. And then I've read a bunch of books about mindset. And the best things that I've read are all the mindset things because they've actually made the biggest changes in my life personally. Mm -hmm. Oh, for sure. It's even been researched that if you stand in front of the mirror and tell yourself you're beautiful or powerful or confident that when you leave the bathroom, like that is how you um, are perceived by people all around you that day. It's like, it's very real telling yourself all of those good things. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. And actually they've also done research with cows and they play Mozart music and the cows produce more milk when Mozart's playing. Really? <laughs> Classical music. Yeah. Really? That is hilarious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I need to, there's a guy I work with and he's, he works in advertising in downtown Toronto, but he's like mm -hmm. a full farm boy and he, his family has this giant cow farm and he just gets endless jokes about being a farmer at our office, but mm -hmm. I got to tell him that. Yeah. See, see if he's tried it out. Some Mozart. Yeah. 
they'll put it in the Holstein journal or mm-hmm. the cow times or whatever. <laughs> he was telling it. There's all those exist, by the way, they're right. all real newspapers for farmers. Oh, wow. <laughs> so what is your vision for Booch from mm. here forward? Cause you guys are growing really fast. Mm. It seems like it hasn't stopped at all. Mm-hmm. Have you just, did you have a small goal and then it just kind of exploded and now your goal is just to take over the world of kombucha or something like mm-hmm. that? Yeah, I think our my vision for Booch is obviously being in more places so that people can consume it and um, become better versions of themselves and have that general sense of well-being that's associated with drinking it. Um, but product line extension is somewhere where I'm really excited to go because... Um, the world of fermented beverages hasn't been explored yet. So I want to be the forefront and actually be the one that's releasing all these new, exciting fermented beverages since people care so much about their gut health now. Um, But further than just a product, you know, I really want to change the way business is done and perceived. You know, when we, when we make new relationships with our retailers, like we want to go in for a hug and actually show them that we're there to care um, we're there to help and support them along the way. So just those small things, um, like we're doing that just to change the way business is. Um, it doesn't have to be a handshake in a corporate world with suits and ties. It could be a, a warm hug and an inviting smile. Um, just something really different. But I think it could go even further to, um, like I'd love to, to teach people how to make kombucha and how to ferment their own food Um And now that we have an audience, I feel like we can um, hone in on them and really change social norms and go even further down that hole. Um, Very cool. mm -hmm. I know I studied business, so for the most part, the culture through my my university experience was a lot more about making tons of money and working in giant companies, dealing with their stock performance and stuff. But Mm -hmm. I remember I had one professor for a course called, it was Sustainable Business, that was the course. And the whole motto of basically that entire course was that he he was a professor who was of the mindset that in the relatively near future, sustainable business is just going to be good business because we've got these corporations taking over all the other small businesses and there's going to be a certain point where everyone starts to appreciate small local businesses more and more than ever because we've kind of realized that they're all gone and we'll value them finally be, because everything else has taken over all the things that we used to love. And he talked about that endlessly about, that was his prediction that that is the forefront of business is small local businesses, mm-hmm. or at least that whole approach. Absolutely. So I and, think you're and to be conscious and socially minded. I don't think any businesses do well these days. If there's not a social backing, Um, businesses have to be doing something with charities for the environment. They have to have that vision. Um, So at Booch, we support three different businesses. Um, Two are local. One's Reforest London in that we're um, helping them uh, plant trees. And another is Growing Chefs. So they're um, educating children on how to grow food and um, tend to the gardens and then harvest the food and then actually make it into a meal. So they're learning these lifelong skills that the normal school system may be missing out on. Um, But we also support CBAN, and they're a charity that takes policy action against GMOs. So, you know, we're trying to understand that change can happen from the ground up at a grassroots level, but also from the top down. So connecting with a larger organization like CBAN, we're trying to take policy action to eliminate GMOs from um, fields in Canada. But having that social piece is really, really important um, because we all have to care for the planet or else we won't have one Mm -hmm. to live on. For sure, especially in this day and age. Mm -hmm. Um, So considering where your business is now, what kind of role do you take on at this point? What what kind of responsibilities? Or are you Mm -hmm. just doing everything? Are you like doing a bit of everything? Um, Because we're still in the growing parts of our business, we haven't been able to maintain and sustain since we started. So I think my role right now is keeping up with, with this growth and strategizing. Um, I'm definitely on board for product line development and that's where I get to use my other skill set of connecting with our local organic farmers, um, to increase a sustainable food system here in London and Ontario. Um, but 
for the future, I could see myself being a part of research that really determines um, which bacteria may be helpful for different health outcomes or behavioral outcomes. Um, I think the future of medicine is bacteria um, and probiotics and fermentation. So long term, um, developing like a food hub that's based on fermented food. Um, and actually, currently, Booch is partnered with the City of London and researchers to, to kind of bring that to life. Uh, there's other industry partners involved, like Nuts for Cheese, uh, Margaret Coons, who's the owner, um, and another local producer of sauerkrauts and kimchi. Um, her name's Valerie Andrews, and she's from the Harvest Pantry. So together, like we're, we're taking this community-based approach to hopefully develop some type of really interesting um, fermented food hub in London, but we want it to be um, like nationwide. So we want to get press nationwide and we want London to be the basis for this whole type of mm, movement, I guess you would say. Yeah, that is super interesting. Yeah. Um, have you ever watched Chef's Table on Netflix? No. Okay, so it's a cooking show. Okay. I'm not really into cooking shows. I don't watch that that often, but this show is amazing. It's like the best chefs from around the world. And there's one lady who's in Korea working at a Buddhist temple as their chef, something along those lines. And all her food is fermented. And she's got food like fermenting in different cellars across their property from like 60 years ago. And she's preparing foods to ferment for people who are going to eat it when she's, when she's not even around anymore. It's a neat episode. Wow. You should watch that. I would absolutely watch that. But um, on that same note, I mean... Um, I was just talking to my roommate about this because he's in med school. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's this really cool awakening happening right now, even among him, because he's, he's just in med school now. Mm -hmm. And I feel like most doctors who might be maybe 30, 40, like 20 or 30 years into their career, there's a whole different approach where it's just, just curing symptoms. Mm -hmm. And that's what medicine basically is for. And it's all temporary, and I get it. There's conspiracies about pharmaceutical companies just doing that on purpose, which is probably very real. But it's really cool that people are starting to realize that you could just take a proactive approach to your health and eat super healthy and naturally, and then you don't have to worry about the symptoms. It's just about being healthy in the first place. And, uh, yeah, I think you're riding the wave of that. Like, obviously, mm -hmm. you're in a pretty good position with where your company kind of sits with its values and what you actually produce. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, have you heard of Ayurvedic medicine? Yeah. It's like kind of, yeah. It starts with an A? Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> starts with I've a. never knew how to pronounce it. Yeah. Um, it's very similar. Like, it doesn't treat an illness on the surface. It goes deep to understand what's going on at that, like, cellu cellular mo molecular level. Um, I won't even go into detail about that. You could do a whole podcast on Ayurveda. I'm sure, I'm sure I could. so cool. I know. I need to find an Ayurveda practitioner. <laughs> I know or one. You do? Yeah. Yeah. Connect us. Okay. I would love to talk <laughs> oh about that. Oh my gosh. Um, this is exactly what we're talking about. Law yeah, of attraction. For okay. sure. For sure. Mm -hmm. That's honestly, this is a huge reason why I'm doing this podcast is because mm -hmm. realistically, I just wanted something new. Like I've been writing articles mm -hmm. for a long time and it's just me sitting there alone, thinking for hours, posting an article and mm -hmm. then just doing the same thing like two weeks later. And it's cool. Right. I like that. It's such a good skill. It really like is a nice feeling when you've churned out an article. But mm -hmm. this is, brings so much more value to my life, like chatting with people who I don't know and, and connecting. I think it's just going to be a really cool tool to meet a lot of awesome people. For sure. And an excuse to have really good conversations with those people because it's mm -hmm. not just like a surface level me kind of... When you, when you just meet people randomly, you don't even dive into stuff about what they're mm -hmm. doing. That's not stuff that... And it would be almost weird to just ask that right off the start, you know? Right. That's what my last, my last friend who I chatted with and posted a podcast with was mm -hmm. talking about. He was like, man, it would be weird if you just invited me over and you're like, do you want to sit down and talk just for two hours straight? <laughs> but you know what? We'll at just the same talk? time, this is where relationships should go. Imagine this is the conversation you had on a regular basis. Like, it'd be so much more deep and meaningful. Yeah. You're right. I like, think, this is where it's at. I know. I think. <laughs> do you do this with your friends? Like, do you just have... Yes. See, I was talking to a, a girl who I know in Toronto about this, and I didn't really know. I was thinking about it, because she was talking about how much 
some of her friendships that broke down, like really just crushed her and how they Mm. crushed her worse than breakups that she's had. Wow. And I was just totally amazed. I was like, that makes no sense. I don't think I can think of, I would be sad, but I can't Mm -hmm. think of any friends, first of all, who I would probably have a A a breakdown with. Yeah. Like Mm -hmm. I have good friendships, I think, (laughs) but guys don't really lean on their friends. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like we're friends, we're close buddies, but we don't really lean on each other the mm-hmm. same way that girls tend to do. For sure. And that's, so we don't lucky. have, <laughs> yeah. women are so lucky that we can go into those emotional states of all of that thinking and analyzing. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. And like, so guys don't really, guys can connect with each other, but conversations like that don't happen mm-hmm. with guys that often. Just, right. I don't know, I guess something, I don't know what it is really. <laughs> We're just different. Obviously. Sure. What, do, what do you think the purpose of life is? Yeah, I know. Like, there's, there's. We have those conversations. I know. There's like very few people. There are. I feel like I'm just the kind of person who has those conversations with mm-hmm. people more than a lot of other people. <laughs> so I tend to have those conversations with some of my guy friends. Mm-hmm. But it's not something that. Yeah, it's like <laughs> dudes don't talk about that stuff. No, definitely not. And that's like the best feedback I get about me posting articles and stuff is that right. people are like, I just. I like hearing guys talk about stuff like that because I don't feel like they ever think about it. That's so true. It's like a lot of dudes think about that, I'm pretty sure. Or at least it's still good for guys to be aware of all that stuff. Right. Big time. Absolutely. That's one thing I found in Toronto. There's a lot more. It's just a way bigger city in general. So there's Mm -hmm. way more different communities that you can be a part of. Mm -hmm. And there's like a mindfulness community and more of that kind of world Mm -hmm. with tons of guys in it. There, yeah. It really does exist there. I mm-hmm. never saw that kind of thing in London one bit, you know, right. just too small for that. Yeah. There's so much support and acceptance there for people to be them true se- their true selves. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Versus London, you know, people are still kind of abiding by society norms and rules. And yeah. But in Toronto, you just looking at the people that are walking by, you're like, wow, like you're really in your shoes and living who you are. And then everyone accepts you. Because there's something about that that's so attractive, being like your true self. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, it's an awesome quality. Yeah. Like, people who are so unabashedly themselves, they're mm-hmm. the best people. And I, yeah. that was, like, something I think I put in my first article I ever wrote. Wow. And it's just something I really believe. And I've mm-hmm. been really fortunate to have a lot of friends like that. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, living in Toronto, like, you see all sides of it, too. There's also mm-hmm. a lot of people who are just, like, walking around in suits, just only care about... True the other side of it. Mm -hmm. It depends where you are in Toronto. Mm -hmm. I'm in a pretty cool area, I think, but it would be really cool to open up boot retailers or no, it'd be cool to open up boot breweries all over the world. And that way I could just travel to all different parts of the world and establish a business there and then give local people jobs because there's a product that's worth it. Amazing. You could put, you can open those and like Costa Rica and Indonesia and all the best places to go. Portugal. Mm -hmm. Spain, Thailand, Australia, New Zealand. Maybe you should write that down as your next vision. I should write that down. So seven years from now. (laughs) Yeah, you're going to have to operate at seven year time spans. (laughs) There's something about that too. Seven years is a thing though. There's something about that. So have you always known that you were celiac or was that kind of something that you discovered more recently? I found out that I was celiac in my last year of university, so it would have been in 2010. Okay. Yeah. And what kind of effects were you having from mm-hmm. from eating wheat and bread and whatever else? Mm-hmm. I was very bloated all the time. So I'd look down and I'd have a pregnant belly and I'd be like, <laughs> what is going on with my body? Um, so that was one of the things. And then I was lethargic, right? And like low in different um, vitamins and minerals. So I was tired all the time. I didn't have energy. And that's because when you're celiac, you can't absorb anything that you're eating because your gut flora is just so messed up. So those are the main things. Okay. Yeah. I know I find, uh, I mean, I have a friend. She actually lives across the street. Oh, really? But, but um, yeah, she... Uh, she is a celiac and she tried to go vegetarian mm-hmm. and um, it started getting worse. Like her stomach got, started getting worse and she went to see a bunch of doctors about it. Mm-hmm. And what they told her was that you already have such a sensitive kind of reaction to certain foods that mm-hmm. you can't eliminate meat because then your body's going to lose its ability to process anything that's hard to process. 
So it's like the fact that she was cutting meat out meant that her body was getting no practice digesting anything difficult to absorb and difficult to break down. Mm -hmm. So then she was becoming more sensitive because her body wasn't used to that at all. Right. So they were like, as a celiac, you can't be a vegetarian. Wow, that's so interesting. I've never heard of that before. Yeah, and I've been hearing about all these people just being aware of how food is affecting them in specific. Mm -hmm. Um, Do you know Jordan Peterson at all? Yeah. So his daughter... I think I have his book. Okay. I'm borrowing it from Andrew. Okay, cool. Great book. Yeah. Um, But anyway, he has a daughter and she has like really bad allergies to basically everything. She has, she's had massive autoimmune problems in her Mm -hmm. entire life. Right. And she could barely even kind of function in society. Right. And she, like, I'm not recommending this diet at all Mm -hmm. because it's, I would never do it. I don't think it's even good for people in general, but Mm -hmm. it just lets her live better. Right. But she started doing an elimination diet when she found out she was a celiac. So Mm -hmm. she did that and then she started trying out eating a bunch of different a bunch of one specific kind of food group at a time Mm -hmm. and then trying it again later and seeing if she got the same reaction. And she Mm -hmm. did that for about a year. Right. And she got to the point where she just eliminated everything except for meat. And she had a lot of different, she had like anxiety and depression caused by her autoimmune problems also. Mm -hmm. And all these other allergies. Apparently she was taking like 10 pills a day or something. Wow. And now she takes no pills for anything. (coughs) She can walk and she can function better than she's ever been able to before Mm -hmm. but she just did that by doing an elimination diet by trying out what works for her body and what doesn't and i think Mm -hmm. there that's a huge thing for like a lot of people that we should all try to probably try and do instead of just because there's a lot of people who just go oh gluten-free is bad i'm not going to eat that and they go Mm -hmm. soy is bad milk is bad Mm -hmm. but it doesn't that doesn't work for everyone yeah absolutely personally I actually tried, I did like a cleanse probably almost a year, about a year ago now. And it was a 21 day cleanse where you took these pills, um, at different times in the day. And they were just natural, natural substances like milk, thistle, things like that. They kind of just cleansed your organs. Mm -hmm. And the nutritionist said that if I wanted to try going vegetarian or vegan, it Mm -hmm. would really dramatically improve the results of the cleanse. Mm-hmm. Because your body can digest fruits and veggies way better and it helps right. like kick out everything else way quicker. Mm-hmm. So I just did it just to try it. And I ate a ton of beans. I found protein in other ways. Mm-hmm. But I like was lower. Like I didn't, I felt good, but I always ate really healthy. Right. So it wasn't a massive transition. Mm-hmm. I felt good, basically the same as before, but I felt less energy. It wasn't that good for me because I exercise a lot. I right. needed more like protein. I needed some carbs. Right. And so being of trying out kind of borderline veganism, vegetarianism actually mm-hmm. wasn't that good for it. It was good, but right. I started eating meat again and I immediately felt like way better. Wow. So that's super interesting. Yeah. Like, are you a vegetarian? I'm a vegan? vegetarian now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I haven't actually from I guess so a year ago when I stopped eating meat. Um, I've only felt better since, but I have heard that it can catch up to you. And at a certain amount of time, like, you know, you could start to feel tired and, you know, um, less clear. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, for Um, sure. And I guess it depends on so many different things, you know? Yeah. Like just my personality, when I go for a run, Mm -hmm. I don't, I can't just like go for a run. I'm always like, all right, I need to make sure this is hard. Mm -hmm. So I'm like kind of always like taking that approach. Right. So my, I feel like I just need to be feeling my body a little more. Right. But yeah, it just makes me, it's kind of, there's so many new approaches to health. And I think Mm -hmm. even men and women should be taking it maybe a little differently. Like for sure, as a man, you should probably focus on things that actually really boost your testosterone and all the, the things mm-hmm. that are good for a man mm-hmm. instead of just being like, I need more vitamin C, all this stuff. Right. It's like, you know, when you have more testosterone and a better hormone balance, your body absorbs vitamins better naturally. Like mm-hmm. there's like a top down approach that I've started taking. Right. So that even women nutrition. should do that too. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I just don't know what that approach would be, but it would be something mm-hmm. similar, you know, like there's right. foods and nutrients that mm-hmm. are better for Yeah, maybe that's something you should do. You should make like an estrogen and testosterone (laughs) boosting kombucha. kombucha. Oh, that's funny. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, I've, I've experimented with tons of diets. Um, I've done like the GAPS diet, which have you heard of it? I've Gut never and heard psychology it. syndrome diet. It's no. essentially like an elimination diet. You take everything out and then you start with bone broth, which has a lot of um, connective tissues. So it's really good for repairing your gut. So as a celiac, I was like, yes, this is exactly what I need because my whole gut is just inflamed and torn apart. Um, so essentially, the, the marrow and the connective tissues um, from the bones are actually going to help repair your gut. And then you slowly start to introduce different food groups like eggs or just egg yolks. Um, and then you keep going from there. But essentially, anything that's pre-broken down, so you're like soups mostly, um, those are easy to digest, and then you start at the very end. That's when you introduce raw, um, which is generally where people have the most, like, the hardest time digesting. Like, after someone eats a head of broccoli, their their belly's going to be super bloated and they're going to be farty. But if it's cooked broccoli, they're more likely to digest it, right? Okay, but aren't mm-hmm. you losing a bunch of the vitamins by cooking broccoli? I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah, and sometimes I don't you're, know that, but you're that's killing, something. like anti-nutrients by cooking things or fermenting things Mm -hmm. so I think it totally depends interesting yeah yeah because that's something I hear all the time like Mm -hmm. don't cook your veggies too much because yeah but for someone like me with celiac if I didn't I'd just be a bloated mess okay and it would cause havoc in my gut really I just know that I don't want to eat that interesting yeah okay cool that's something I have Mm -hmm. to look into maybe Mm mm-hmm it's really interesting. So I am also anaphylactic to nuts. So I have a super severe nut allergy. If I eat a nut, I will die. Um, any nut? Any nut except for peanuts because they're considered a legume. Oh, mm-hmm. weird. Yeah. But this one time I accidentally had a fermented cashew. My friend who owns nuts for cheese, her cheese was blended in a soup that I ate and I had zero reaction whatsoever. And normally I would be, my throat would close up and I'd be rushed to the hospital and I would almost die. So it speaks to the volume of fermentation in that there's some chemical breakdown happening that actually allowed my body to consume it without any reaction whatsoever. Whoa. Right. That's some new science that I'm sure we'll learn about eventually. Yeah. And in my fermentation group, that has happened to another person. They, they could also eat a fermented nut Whoa. by accident, Whoa. but it happened and there was no reaction. So what is your fermentation group? Is that like a group where you guys go and kind of experiment with stuff and talk about what's working? Well, so it's a group of industry partners. Um, then there's Lawson researchers. Right now they're conducting research on booch to um, identify the microbes in our kombucha. Oh, so okay. they're going to say, they're going to find out how many um, bacteria any species exist and which ones they are. Okay. Um, and then the city of London is involved in that group because we're trying to grow some type of fermentation hub and be like the forefront of research um, for fermented foods and kombucha. That is awesome. So, Yes. Cool. That's well, the group. I'm excited to see where Booch goes because you guys are <laughs> obviously doing some neat things and being on the forefront of research and, and what's coming next is a really cool place to be. Thank you. I'm so excited to see where it goes. <laughs> Sweet. I think that's a pretty good place to, to I cut think it. so too.